Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kevin Kearns. Uh, Kevin, Dr. Kearns is now Interim Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at SUNY State University of New York, Fredonia. Um, he is a PhD speech pathologist and professor uh, who previously was the Dean of Graduate Studies uh, at Fredonia, I believe, and has been there. Also, uh, Dr. We're really fortunate because Dr. Kearns has also been working, working here in Cleveland as a consultant to the Monarch School and to Vizzle, as well as to other, and, and to Harvard in terms of the research ongoing at Monarch in, in their intervention program. So he has a, already a connection to Cleveland and a, a lot of work consulting in autism. Currently, I, I just want to give you a few ideas of the awards that Dr. Carnes has uh, won over the last couple of years. First, he's an honorary member of the Golden Key International Honor Society. He has honors from the Academy of Neurologic Communication Disorders and Sciences. Has been a visiting scholar at a number of universities, including the University of Florida. He's in the Speech Language Pathology Hall of Fame. Uh, <laughs> from the Association of Speech-Language Pathologists, not too many of those, and a member of the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society, Phi Kappa Phi Honor Society from Northeastern University, and a fellow of the American Speech, Hearing, and Language Association. He also won the Outstanding Alumni Award and Distinguished Lecturer from St. Louis University. So we're really looking forward to your lecture today. Uh, Dr. Cards has been working on a data system for identifying how you would uh, figure out how to demonstrate that interventions are working in children with autism, and that's what he's going to speak to us about today. So let's welcome you to Cleveland. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Here, I'll try and work the technology and the slides at the same time. We'll see what happens. Um, what I'm going to have to say to you this afternoon is probably a little different from what you're used to listening to. Uh, I've heard a lot about the wonderful translational research that's going on. Um, and uh, this is going to be data light, very little data. And what I'd like to walk you through is a multi-year collaboration and process um, that um, grew and grew, and, and I'm going to update you where we are today. Um, in particular, um, this collaboration has been wonderful, <laughs> frankly, with the Monarch School for Autism, uh, Deborah Mandel, and Susie Ratner, Chris Carter, and others. Um, in addition, uh, Dr. Howard Shane from Children's in Boston and uh, Harvard, along with people from the MGH uh, Hospital Institute, where I was previously. and. Um, Finally, the Monarch Teaching Technology folks, uh, uh, Terry Murphy in particular, and all of his crew. So uh, with that, um, what I'm going to do is take you on a journey. Please stop. It's a small group, and I hope we can have a conversation rather than put you through a whole bunch of PowerPoint slides. So um, I will admit up front that um, this has been a fun, exciting project. I'll also tell you that I have more questions than answers still after eight or ten years <laughs> into this. And so with that, um, let's provide some context. One of the issues these days that you all know about as well or better than I do is that everyone is saying they're evidence-based. Um, and most programs, Monarchs included, really develop their curriculum around evidence-based practice um, information. The problem is there are hundreds, literally, these days of evidence-based uh, practice guidelines and reviews. They're all from their own perspective, and they all use different criteria for coming up with what they feel is evidence-based. And so sorting through all of that, whether you're a clinician or a researcher and getting direction is can be uh, quite a challenge. I want to mention as context for what I'm going to say, uh, one of the more recent um, reviews by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, 
to frame one of the rationales for why we went down this road that we went down. So this is kind of typical of these uh, evidence-based reviews. Um, it's a little different, however, in that the standards for what was left in and what was left out really were uh, much more stringent than most, given that it's a federal agency charged with um, looking at the quality of health care. Um, you wouldn't expect anything else. But in their comparative effectiveness review, they started out with um, over 4,000 um, citations and, and studies uh, to review. And their reviews span medical, behavioral, educational, allied health, really across the spectrum. The amazing thing is, though, when all was said and done, this review ended up giving full attention to only 183 um, published articles. What this points out in part, and where we're going with uh, what I'm going to say this morning, is that methodological problems are uh, significant. It's a problem for the literature, and it's a problem both for our research and for our clinical practice. One of the um, issues that we talked about this morning, I think, uh, or this afternoon with, with Lee, I thought I saw her here, uh, was the fact that um, problems such as small n, of course, but also 40% of the studies reviewed didn't have a basic comparison group. So that what we know about research um, across the interventions is um, fairly shaky. It's growing. Uh, but we still have a long way to go. Across all categories, the strength of evidence was less than, let's say, satisfactory. Um, in medicine, there were a couple of areas, medicines that looked pretty good uh, with good strength of evidence and random control, tr randomized control trials. The problem was that the, there were very significant um, uh, side effects with those medications. And so even where there is strong evidence, there are issues. And that's why we're all here, right? Well, the reason I'm mentioning this particular review is that one of the key problems that hasn't been fully addressed is here on these bullets. Um, if the goal is to eventually develop interventions that can be targeted for individuals, and that's what we all say, then we have a long way to go. In these treatment studies, there were over 100 outcome measures used. And that didn't include any of the subscales. So literally, when all was said and done, done, excuse me, hundreds of outcome measures across these 183 studies. Obviously, that leads to chaos. And so there is a call um, through NIH and uh, AHRQ for st standardized outcome measures if we're going to move the field along uh, in terms of looking at and comparing treatments for children on the spectrum. <clears throat> Again, please stop me. I'm going to be drinking up here. I have. Uh, dry mouth from my, from my medicine. Um, so this collaboration we've been uh, involved in really goes back eight or ten years now. And uh, through the um, MGH Harvard connection, Dr. Shane, myself, and other folks have worked closely with Monarch to develop the Monarch curriculum. I'm not going to talk much about this. Um, to build um, and develop technology-based interventions and to uh, try and develop hopefully replicable uh, treatment paradigms for children on the spectrum. What I'm going to talk about this morning um, is our data collection system and in particular what we've called the Monarch, Monarch Outcome System and even more specifically the PEARS data collection system um, which is used at the school to drive individualized instruction. So with that context, we're going to talk a little bit about this PEARS system, which I'll explain in just a second. Um, and ultimately, where this is going to go, or we hope it's going to go, and 
make the obvious distinction between the data collection system and an outcomes management system. And it's the outcomes management system that makes the most sense in terms of having an impact on the field. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing to clean up some of the problems that we've identified as well as look at future directions. Uh, one thing is clear, there are a lot of data collection opportunities out there. If you just go Google uh, autism data outcome system, you'll find eight or ten pretty quickly. Um, I can share those if, if you like. But most are behavioral data collection system, and very few, if any, are truly comprehensive. And so what we tried to do is to step back and say, okay, how can we develop some principles first for an outcome system that would last, and then how can we uh, move down this road towards an outcomes management tool? It's awfully quiet in here. <laughs> so one of the problems we identified or issues we identified initially is that there is a tendency in a lot of settings, schools, and, and clinics um, to use discipline-specific tracking mechanisms. Um, that is, more or less, everyone is doing their own thing. The problems with that are obvious, and that was kind of where we started with all of this. It makes uh, comparisons across disciplines for the same kids difficult. Um, it's very difficult and challenging to plan uh, in an integrated way uh, for uh, and prioritize treatment outcomes for these kids. Um, and oftentimes it's certainly not comprehensive, subjective, um, and certainly the issues of psychometric quality and validity uh, is an issue. So with that in mind, we thought, well, what are the basic data requirements that we want to try and work toward and uh, are still working towards eight or ten years later. And I'm going to just mention these and then talk a little bit about kind of the conceptual background for what we did and then talk about the system. Uh, first of all, we said, well, if we're going to do this, there should be some conceptual salience to what we're trying to do. That is, there should be either a theory, rationale, or basic um, approach that we're trying to embed both in the instruction and in the data system. Um, psychometric qualities, ideally, of course, and eventually uh, the tool would need to be reliable, valid, sensitive, and all of that. Um, one thing that is a little unique is that what we are trying to do is develop an agnostic system. And what I mean by that is um, there are ABA systems, uh, systems developed for a specific approach, but really to get anywhere and eventually have an outcomes management system, um, it really should be uh, atheoretical from the perspective of the intervention. That's a really important point. And what I mean by that is pretty simple. We were looking for a data system that could be used by different disciplines, of course, but we're also looking to develop a system that was robust enough to manage um, anything from structured ABA type intervention to more environmentally based approaches. And a uh, little tricky, but I think ultimately doable. We want, wanted the system to be practical and we wanted to be able to use this with parents and other lay people. So those were the principles that we started out with. I'm going to take just a minute and back up and talk about um, the rationale for the system, uh, what I just a minute ago called the conceptual salience. So um, you're all familiar, I think, about the World Health Organization uh, classification of functioning and disability. Um, started over a decade ago for adults and then, as you'll see in a second, was expanded to kids in 2007. Um, this framework is partly the basis, as you'll see, for the rating systems that we came up with. And the important features, um, I think, will be obvious in just a minute. But in terms of, in terms of the ICF, 
uh, there are two basic categories, functioning and disability and contextual factors. Body functions and structures, I think we all know what those are, right? <laughs> um, and then in activities and participation uh, grouping. Contextual factors, environmental and personal. Personal are kind of off the table because of the incredible variability. Now, what the World Health Organization is trying to do is to develop a series of codes for each of these disabilities and functioning that reflect a, in a comprehensive way where uh, children and adults are. Um, so, in addition to these basic codes, there are also what they call qualifiers um, and essentially subscripts or subcodes, right? And so very quickly, body functions are uh, rated, coded on severity, activities and participation on assistance. So if you're a D3 1.0.3, you have a severe speech, spoken language comprehension problem in a natural environment. That's great, but can anyone remember that? <laughs> I had to check the number about 18 times to make sure I had it right. The point, while this is used a lot overseas, it's not been adopted even though several federal agencies are looking at it here. What is valuable though, um, I think, is the notion that, uh, that um, limitations, assistance, and barriers are key to functionality. Not everyone with the same disorder is equally impaired. And so somehow we have to capture that. And this was a uh, massive attempt to do that in a fairly complicated coding kind of way. But the idea that um, same disorder, di different functioning, different reaction to, of an individual to barriers, and different need for assistment, assist, uh, <laughs> excuse me, assistance, um, ultimately, uh, lead one towards thinking about disability in a certain way. Let me see if I, well, I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. And, and the, the arrow points towards two things that we adopted for this PAIRS coding system. Number one, assistance. Anyone in rehabilitation, really, and, and clinical practice, um, for the last 15 or 20 years has made book on the fact that maximum independence is really what we strive for with these kids and, other, and, and adults with uh, disabilities. The more independent, the better, right? The other thing that is key in terms of interventions across the disciplines, not medicine perhaps, but across the behavioral disciplines and allied health, is how much assistance is required to facilitate a functional independent response based on the disability and their responding, the individuals responding to, uh, to barriers. That logic is what has driven um, this system, which um, I don't know where we got pairs. I guess uh, it came in early and stayed, but it's fairly description. So what we came up with is the participation, accuracy, independent rating scales or pairs. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about these scales and then talk a little bit about this journey and where we hope it will ultimately take us. So essentially there are two um, rating scales within this system. Um, there's a rich history in speech language pathology of using multidimensional rating, rating scales and um, in rehabilitation, especially for adults, with the FIM and NOMS and all the other acronym types of scales. Now, while it's well accepted in rehabilitation, there are many, many problems associated with using rating scales, especially um, uh, rating scales that aren't really interval scales for measurement. So we know this, and we're trying to wrestle with it. But in any event, participation scales. This is a simple, simple um, judgment, uh, which is being uh, programmed kind of as we speak, to capture participation during a session or an activity. 
Now, why in the world would we think about participation as it relates to um, a kid on the spectrum? It's kind of obvious, right? <laughs> you can have a half hour session with the child or an assessment session with the child, and all is well and good if you score their behavior and you say they did or they didn't do X, Y, or Z. The problem, of course, is that um, they may or may not have been with you participating, attending, giving themselves an opportunity to learn for half or more of that session. So for my money, I think it makes sense to try and capture not just how well they do, but are they actively engaged in learning during that task or that session or that assessment? So this is a key notion that is and continues to be a little squishy, um, but conceptually I do think it's salient, and as we move towards technological solutions, I think it's capturable, if that's a word. In addition to the participation scale, which is a simple rating of the level of participation, um, we're also using subscripts to capture why the child wasn't fully participating in that learning opportunity or in that evaluation. So essentially this simple scale, we're looking for parsimony, involves how much participation and if there was a decrease in participation in activity, what was the reason for that? Um, decreased attention, self-stim, and all of that stuff. The second scale um, in the pairs is what we've called an accuracy independence scale. And you can already see where this came from. Uh, the notion of uh, is embedded in the adult rehab, and it's also embedded in the World Health Organization notions. So obviously, how well or accurately a task is completed or a session is completed. Uh, but in addition, and most importantly, how much assistance was used to get maximum, particip or maximum performance during, say, a clinical session. Oftentimes, um, scoring systems, rating scales, are pretty much dichotomous. They did it, they didn't do it. Again, like participation, that misses the boat. There are nuances and almost inevitably, clinician or caregiver help really needs to be captured to get the full sense of what was involved in performance. Like the subscripts, or what the World Health Organization would call qualifiers for participation, there are also subscripts, qualifiers for accuracy and dependence, and in particular, simply coding what worked as a facilitative prompt, cue, or assist, so that we can track those two. So that's, that's the idea, in a nutshell. And um, let me tell you a little bit about um, these, again, simple parsimonious scales. Um, the devil's in the details, I know, but you'll get the idea, and then we can talk about them a little bit. For participation, simple rating scale from 0 to 5, which reflect essentially per percent of full engagement. So level of participation. And then again, with the qualifiers to say, OK, if they're not engaged, what happened? Are they self-stimming? Are they inattentive, et cetera? Whoops. So you know, the levels are pretty obvious and transparent. Uh, you know, percentage-wise, how much act active engagement was there in a session? Now, we will talk later about, um, as we've gone to a, an automated system, trying to take the subjectivity out of this, obviously going towards using timers and sessions and that types of th type of thing. But for the participation level, zero to five, um, no participation. Uh, the child simply wasn't there that day or that session or that evaluation to complete. They were really on and focused and, uh, and doing well. <clears throat> A key to the participation, as I said, are these subscripts. And this is a simple way of coding why. Why weren't they fully participating, right? 
Was it an attention problem, aggression, escape, um, self-stim? Were they obsessing over the <laughs> um, whatever, the, pe the pencil that you're using, right? So if we step back and think about it, now the clinicians and teachers using this aren't behavioral interventionists, but that data when put together, that is how much participation and why, uh, tells a story and that story sometimes says, okay, you'd better get behavioral intervention or you're not gonna get anywhere on your language goals or your OT or whatever, right? So it's a, an early warning system for focusing resources and goals for kids. And oftentimes, these kind of interfering factors will be worked with simultaneously. For the AI scale, it's similarly um, easy to grasp. It's just a simple rating scale from no response to fully accurate and dependent. Uh, the key to this scale really is the middle, and that um, is a reflection of um, how much assistance is, you, is provided from minimum to maximum assistance. Um, and uh, so two, uh, from a no response to two, an inaccurate response to um, maximum or moderate levels of assistance um, to minimal assistance to they got it, may not be perfect, but they got it. That six is kind of an odd duck uh, as a rating scale goes. But um, the reason for the rating of six is that an awful lot of our kids obviously approximate, um, and I'll use a communication example because I'm a speech language pathologist, they, they, they get the point across, but their sentences may be fractured. They communicate, but they may not say it well. So the idea of that six rating is, was it successful, but still within their system, perhaps not um, uh, neurotypical. Okay, so that's why we have that in there. So again, laid out, it looks something like this, from no response to accurate independent, with the assists in the middle and the functional approximation, uh, meaning good job but not perfect towards the top. This is obviously multidimensional, and this, uh, I won't go into the speech pathologists in the room will appreciate going back to the 70s, this type of scale has been used um, for looking at adults and ASHA with kids and others. But basically the idea is that accurate isn't just accurate, right? Especially with children with processing and other disorders, um, a judgment really is inherent in terms of whether it's a correct response, um, good but incomplete, maybe delayed, uh, inefficient, all of those go into that six, uh, whoops, there we go. So ultimately we're looking for this scale to give us some sense of degree of assistance. Um, and this is more complex than it seems of course too, but really what we look at as an, uh, an assist on the assistance quoting is a quantitative uh, measure to help the clinicians. Um, so, simply put, although there is judgment about burden on the assessor, uh, with the maximum amount of assist, there's a cumulative effect, right? If you have to repeat it or provide input three or more times, that really is essentially doing it for them or close, it's max assist. Moderate two repeats or cues and then minimum, simply one or a little nudge uh, to get them there. So, again, simple, it's intended to be simple, uh, and it is. The AI codes, um, again, pretty, pretty obvious. What type of assist, from physical to gestural, et cetera. All right. So, one of the things worth mentioning is as we've gone down this road, this, <laughs> to get to this point, uh, took quite a while. One of the things I want to mention, though, is that um, from the get-go, what we're trying to do is develop a system that automatically interfaced with our goals and objectives on the IEPs, uh, as well as the state standards. So this journey, this evolution, uh, required us to define what we think and what we mean as um, 
adequate progress as mastery, and then to build that into the back end of the system, for example. And then also to track uh, the goals and objectives and success along that continuum from no or minimum progress to maximum uh, or mastery. The other thing we are looking for, and I'll give you a sample in just a second, is this notion that um, the data should be aggregated for individuals so you can pull from the system. Uh, it's automated now. You can pull from the system essentially time series data for the individual, right? So uh, weekly probes are given on the various goals and objectives, and those are plotted over time so that you have a sense of do you really need to tweak intervention for an individual. Rationale is also obvious, I think, and transparent, and that is that uh, heretofore and still in a lot of schools uh, and clinical settings, data are looked at quarterly when, it's real, when a report is due, right? And it's too late to do anything to change the intervention at that point. Clinicians in the, in the room know what I mean. Um, another um, piece of this is to give the school or the setting the ability to look at programs. So how do kids in a certain group do? How do kids in speech do versus OT versus whatever? And so ultimately, you can see where this is going. It accumulates up to the school level and um, the possibility of a school report card, if you will, for looking at how well the school is doing across clinical and educational domains so that there's a dashboard, a snapshot. Um, if you're going to a funding agency, if you're going to a school, you're in a position to say, look, you know, for our group of X kids, um, this percentage of them reached this level of performance over this amount of time. So that's, uh, again, pretty straightforward. So I'm going to give you um, a sample report card. I guess I should have asked Deborah first, but, <laughs> but it's a good report card. So I'm always OK when my kids come back with good report cards. Uh, just to give you a sense of how this stuff is graphed up, and I'll, I'll just give you one uh, quick example. And then we'll move on to talking about some of the issues and where we're going and where we think we need to be eventually. This was, I think, uh, these are data from 11-12 uh, academic year. Uh, there were over 80 students that completed IEPs. Um, one of the ways we look at this is really how many kids um, for their IEP goals um, improved enough to consider those goals mastered. Similarly, how many kids made adequate progress, again, predefined criteria, during this quarter this year. Um, we also then put those together, because given the nature of the kids, given uh, uh, the severe disabilities that we're sometimes working with, um, the combination of how many were mastered and made adequate progress. Same thing for objectives. So these accumulate to give you a little report card. So here's a snapshot. Um, let me go back a little bit. So for, for this snapshot, 88% of the goals were either mastered or uh, progress was made. Uh, this is over, uh, over the year for the IEP term and 84% of the objectives. <clears throat> and these are for over 2,000 objectives across all of the disciplines. So it's a fairly robust snapshot uh, for a, a period of time. Then, of course, you can map this out any way you want, of course, for the individuals and over time. But if you look at, across the bottom of the graph, you see what we would call domains. So uh, speech, executive skills, language arts. Uh-oh. I don't want you to do anything. Yeah. There we go. Uh, OT, um, et cetera. And then uh, the graphs represent quite obviously, if you look to the right, uh, the percentage of objectives that were mastered, 
or adequate progress, et cetera. And uh, green is good and yellow is fine. So if you, this is how we get to that report card by tallying across domains those goals and objectives that met certain predetermined criteria. And we could dissect this further, but essentially what you see is that the combination of mastery and adequate progress really is pretty impressive across a year's span for over 80 kids and over 2,000 objectives. Um, that's the nuts and bolts of it. We could back out and look at individual, yeah. what that means, because that seems to be the area that, and you would think that that would be the least <coughs> yeah. intervention, but. Well, that's, that's, you know, obviously that's one that dipped, um, you know, below 50% in mastery. And that, maybe. well, that, yeah, that's the issue. If you go out into the environment, um, if you're working on generalization of uh, skills uh, that were worked on in the clinic, or in the school, and you go out to a theater or to a camp, and you try and monitor those, you still get some of that. Uh, it's a more complex environment. That's the golden ring, right? I think this is pretty the darn good. World to the real yeah, I, I think this is pretty darn good for. You're getting generalization on, or you're getting. Um, improvement on what you're actually teaching, right? So we don't really teach leisure skills very much well, and we do really teach some of these other ones, and the ones you're really teaching, you're getting mastery of, or at so, least at the minimum. So enough to feel good about. And these aren't all in the natural environment, but clearly activities that carry over to uh, uh, the playground, for example. Uh, so not necessarily going out to summer camp. But uh, that's one of the toughest ones. Generalization is still the, the golden ring. And uh, I think under the circumstances, it's pretty impressive to get uh, these type of results. Well, try and watch my time a little bit. <coughs> this um, is just to show you, if you look uh, to the far right, essentially where we are now is that the staff are using, uh, taking data on their iPads and um, and phones, et cetera, uh, to try and minimize you know, the paper. I can tell you, and Deborah will <laughs> reinforce this, the use, you know, we knew from day one we had to get away from the paper, right? We started with, um, a, a, you have to start with a paper-based system. And then what do you have to do? You have to keep your data, then you have to scan that data. Then it goes into a database and then trying to tease that apart is, is really a bear. And what we found was that as long as we were hung up on the paper until we got really into an automated system, uh, there were plenty of data integrity issues that we had to wrestle with. Uh, clinicians wouldn't, or teachers, wouldn't put their data in right away, right? And it would be the end of the quarter and we would go in the system and we'd say, well, someone just put in, you know, 10 weeks worth of data, how do we trust that? So there was an awful lot of lessons learned and cleaning up of data integrity as we morphed uh, to the new system. Uh, we're using Canvas, which is a cloud-based system in part, as well as uh, having the clinicians input um, their IEPs and other data. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. Let's transition in the few minutes left, I want to take uh, save time for, um, for conversation. Um, but let's talk a little bit about kind of lessons learned, limitations, and then where we're going to go. Um, the big bugaboo, of course, with all of this, especially with rating scales, are uh, the psychometric properties. Reliability, validity, and sensitivity. You know, are your tools replicable across individuals and over time? You know, is that is it not idiosyncratic to the score, right? Uh, validity, does it stack up to whatever measure? And the one we've played with a little bit is the WeFIM, which has its own issues. And then sensitivity, can you really, um, is the scale sensitive enough to pick up change over time? So we're wrestling with those. Internally, we've um, 
trained staff and gotten um, very acceptable reliability. But we don't know yet, and we're working with the group in um, the Carolinas, whether or not um, other clinicians at other sites will get the same kind of results. Um, we're, we've developed some videotaping of gold standard exemplars, if you will, uh, to do this, but that's still a work in progress. But frankly, um, until we get there, we're comfortable internally, but not exporting necessarily what we've been doing. Um, a real uh, discovery for us, and it was obvious in retrospect, you ever have one of those where <laughs> you think, why didn't I see this coming? Uh, but that is the issue of technical drift. Given that the school and all schools and hospitals basically operate in units, um, you could train um, the staff up to 90% reliable, right? But then they talk and they'd say, uh, well, that felt like a five to me and the others, well, wh wh how'd you get a five out of that? And before you know it, that whole unit is drifting off of uh, the standard, right? And so they're reliable within, but they're not agreeing with the speech pathologists down the hall who are also kind of developing their old standards. So technical drift is a real issue and the notion that we have to repeatedly tweak and train uh, is, is very real. And that's one of the issues with uh, the efficiency, the time, and the cost. Um, and I've already mentioned the need for monitoring uh, data integrity uh, and quality. Let's see what else. So what we're doing now and then where we're going. Um, one of the things with uh, Monarch teaching technologies that we've been doing is looking at ways to improve automation and essentially um, power for assessing the interventions. And what I mean by that is we've done a lot of the architecture on the front end, but more powerful relational databases are certainly needed and where we need to go, as well as additional functionality. We, we are taking the data uh, on mobile devices, um, but there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained. And I'll, I have a few screenshots if we have time. I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, I, I think that the ultimate uh, goal here um, is that we really need to be able to look not just at how are the results for clinic, clinicians in education, but really what are the relationships through reasonable query of the developed large databases, multiple schools, multiple clinics, where we can say, what is the relationship between the clinical data, the demographics, uh, the drugs the kids are on, um, the genetic information, and, and how does that inform our choices? One of the first things I said was, you know, according to AHRQ, I always reverse those, uh, is that really the coin in the realm is comparative effectiveness research. And where this needs to go, its logical conclusion, if we're alive to see it, <laughs> is not just to do re refine the data system, but to build powerful relational databases that crosswalk across other large databases. So the registries and the uh, genetics information, um, et cetera. So we're looking to and, and actually working actively on expanding the power and functionality, um, looking at efficiencies. I mentioned part participation. Um, I still like the idea and, and we're finding value in it, but until it's automated, it's a little squishy. It, you know, we can have uh, reliability checks on people collecting the data, and we can get pretty good agreement that, yeah, it was about 60% participation, but until it's automated, um, we're not as far along as we need to get. Um, and the other functionality uh, things that you see there. So um, really where we want to go this ultimately is clinical benchmarking and getting to the point where we have sufficient uh, 
reliable, trustworthy data sets, kind of least common denominators, that can be used so that other schools and hospitals, et cetera, can feed into the same system so that ultimately Monarch or the school down the road or a school in Buffalo or in, in Boston, um, if they share their data like the UDS, UDS system um, does at uh, University of Buffalo uh, with their FIM data. When the FIM first came out, everyone laughed at it, right? Functional independence measure, uh, which is a um, 16, uh, 16 behaviors are rated from a bowel and bladder to communication. No one really liked it, um, but they accumulated such a wealth of data and benchmarking so that they essentially captured adult rehab. And now, for the purposes of funding, if you're uh, uh, an adult rehab setting, you have to use FIM if you want to get funded. I think that that model is a model we should strive toward with autism. Take some of the noise out so that we know who's receiving what treatment. You know, we all know, and the data show, and um, if you look at the evidence-based practice reviews, we all know that some kids, if you line two kids up and they look great, maybe they're even twins, I don't know, with similar problems, child A does real well on certain things and child B does not. But we don't have a clue why. The other thing that a large clinical database that's relational with all of these other things that we know we need uh, will do for us is it will allow us with predictive analytics to say, you know, given this genetic profile, given uh, this um, severity profile, given this language profile, we can predict with relative certainty that this type of treatment and um, targeted to these types of behaviors will likely result in improvement. But if we do this, it won't. That's where this is, we hope, going. So common metrics for comparison, um, allowing participants, schools, and universities to have online ready access to large databases so that they can um, modify their programs. Uh, adjust their so-called case mix, and then ultimately, hopefully, to influence funding decisions. So um, that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're up to. Let me see. Thank you. This was outstanding. And I think all of us that do data and research recognize the huge tasks you've undertaken and, and to be able to start pulling these pieces of information together. It's just, it's just huge. I, the NIH has put out an RFA for really out how they, we still don't know how to say that a child has become less autistic with an intervention. Right. And, that, and there's this big RFA out to say how do we, how will we be able to measure that? And so far as I can tell, nobody's been able to come up with a, no fundable proposal, um, and yet it seems that these pieces would fit into that eventually in terms of what components of this would you put into an area that would say this child is less autistic yeah. from your intervention? Right. And that, that seems to be, how do, how do we tell yeah. that autism, you know, that those features are being affected? Well, I think, I think the challenge is, you know, what we mentioned or what I mentioned, and that is to have really psychometrically sound um, tools that are also parsimonious. They're relatively simple, but yet they're sensitive to change over time. No one has nailed the sensitive to change over time piece yet. This is, you know, what we're hoping for, but um, we can't claim to have the data uh, to do that yet. Um, but whether this approach or another approach, I think um, coming to a set of least common, you know, a, a, a set of common metrics that people will buy into that are psychometrically sound is the case. In terms of a proposal, you've got to start someplace. And, and one place to start, um, this has been beta tested clinically. Um, 
you know, and what we've talked about is seeking funding for the psychometric piece. Uh, while we uh, move forward on the technological solutions to take some of the noise out so that when we talk about participation, it's not subjective. It's in a timer on the computer. Um, uh, and so I think that it's a drill down rather than, um, uh, than something else, and I think that's, that's a possibility. Yeah. Yes? Common matches, and, you know, for comparison. And, you know, in autistic children, sometimes, in terms of body function, for example, mm -hmm. some children um, maybe have the same level of severity, but some children has a function problem with the hands, some sometimes with the legs and walking. Does, does, does that make a difference? I mean, do, do you need another subset? in terms of which part of the body function will correlate with treatment or work? That's, that's a great question. I think that we've not really played with the use of the, um, um, the World Health Organization classifications. Um, there's a, uh, uh, Travis Treats at um, St. Louis University has uh, done some of that work and I think really to get more sophisticated, ultimately you need that umbrella of classification that has really now been beta tested worldwide and adopted. Um, that to me would be one of those um, uh, pieces of information in a relational database base that would allow you to say, okay, this, this kid is a plus three in terms of tone and he has this, that, and the other thing. Um, how does that matter? Well, not only that, he's on X drugs, uh, you know, because of that spasticity. Does that matter? Or he's on a psychotropic because of, I don't know, pick your poison, attention or something. Um, bad example, but you get the idea. Uh, so that's, that's really where I think this has to go. But I think you really have to build a brick at a time and... Um, as squishy as this feels oftentimes, if you don't nail down the basic uh, idea of what is sensitive to change over time that can be replicated across settings and conditions, then none of the rest matters. And the reason I threw up that um, original information on you know, AHRQ was just that. I think they're right. Um, that without reasonable metrics, and we're not even close yet, but without reasonable metrics, you can't answer those other questions, such as what is the relation between uh, balance, spasticity, attention, and uh, improvement? That, that's the key. But part of the answer to your question is using uh, the World Health Organization system, which codes that information pretty well uh, as one of the databases you pull from. Are there other places developing these kinds of systems for autism, like connect connection? Because this seems to me to be pretty advanced in terms of especially the educational programs to be able to do. There's only one that I've found that um, uh, and I can't, I'm blanking on the name, I apologize, not that I don't want to give them air time, <laughs> um, that attempts to be comprehensive. Um, but there's nothing really that I think um, captures this idea of not just the whole person, but what are the barriers, how much assistance does it take to get over the barriers, and how actively engaged are they? And I think those key concepts are important and critical Again, it's, a, it's a, a measurement challenge that's enormous, but I do think um, I, I'm not aware of anything that takes into to consideration those parameters. That personally, and I think the school fields are really important to getting a picture of the whole child. Yeah, Lee. I'm sorry, Betsy had to leave because she probably should be asking questions instead of me. But 
you know, I've been sort of trying to figure out um, when you're assessing a child pr primarily in terms of disabilities and then hoping that intervention actually alleviates some of the disability, you leave out of the picture that with all the individual differences in a child across the board, you have some things that the child is good or better at. Right. And you're losing some of those positives oftentimes when you're assessing just the disability side, which, but it, at the same time, it can actually help compensate. Um, there can be some uh, ways that they, you know, can make up for some of their sure. deficits with their strengths. And it, can we capture that somehow in terms of predicting outcomes for the kid and capitalizing on those strengths with the intervention? Um, I hope so. I think, I think the idea of, um, you know, that not every child with what seems to be the same severity of the same disability is created equal is the key. Um, and I think, again, looking at uh, a coding system, and I'm s using the World Health Organization because that's the best thing out there, which captures things like, you know, in this environment, they do pretty well. Um, if you put them someplace else, not so well. So I, th I think that kind of gets at it. But you're right, we don't look fully at ability and we focus on disability, and that is a problem. Um, but ultimately, I think if the umbrella is how well and independently someone functions in an environment with or without assistance, it's global enough that we could get some of those refinements in there, but uh, it is kind of a missing link that's implied but not specifically measured. I agree. Thank you. This is incredible. Oh, thank you.